we had to pick each other up at least eight or nine times between Can somebody the help me <laughs> i'm down again i stepped no. on this spike trap <laughs> I totally agree. The, the the sticks, the sharpened sticks did such a good. I think they even made an impact on us. Okay, and just so you all know, this will be the last episode that Don't Crawl will be part of the State of Survival podcast. <laughs> State of Survival podcast, bringing you survival game news. Welcome in, everyone. Welcome in. We are here with the State of Survival podcast, and in case you're wondering who we are, we are a group of survival game nerds that talk about the ins and outs of upcoming titles as well as really popular titles. And a lot of what we discuss are gaming news as well as game theories and upcoming things we hope to see in the genre. And uh, I am joined, of course, with my lovely cast. Let's go ahead and go around the circle and see how everybody's doing. Dump, how's it going, buddy? It is going actually pretty well. Folks, I, before I went down to visit my family, I tried to replace my oil pan and I royally screwed up. So I was leaking oil kind of like a sieve. I was surprised I was able to go about 400 miles without having issues. But yesterday I was able to fully replace the oil pan and fix it. But you guys Heck aren't here yeah. to listen about that, right? Like, come on, who wants to hear about my oil pan issues? Why don't we go ahead and talk <laughs> about uh, some of the stuff I'm doing? I have been... Uh, once again, tackling rigging, and I actually pretty soon will have a fun little uh, martial arts boxing uh, thing between the two characters, uh, and it's going to be kind of fun to display and show it to you folks. Um, but in other news, I've been working hard behind the scenes in the podcast itself, and as some of you may have noticed, episode three's highlights actually just aired. So go ahead and make sure you guys check that out because. I absolutely love doing work for the podcast, but that's pretty much it on my end. All right. Thank you, Dump. Well, let's now check with our producer and the all omnipotent power here. Red Falcon. Red Falcon, how's it going, buddy? The disembodied voice. Going good. Um, got the fabulous State of Survival podcast studio organized, finely tuned and like a well-oiled machine. Um been doing some a little bit more work on the both the heli and boat mods so had some kind of at the end of an update cycle for the the helis um, had some last minute fixes from the updates over the last couple weeks and boats some more uh, bug fixes and then starting to work on some of the next stuff uh, being able to load vehicles in the back of the larger helicopters and fly them around um, but that's leading into doing a bunch more work with cameras that I haven't dealt with in Daisy before so uh, pretty exciting stuff and then getting started on my uh, state of survival five uh, survival games that we recommend uh, since dump keeps busting my chops about it I figured I better knock it out Chops about it. <laughs> well, you know what, Red? I know Dump bust your chops about it, but I really wanted to hand it to you. Panning in that oil joke was perfect. Like, if you still <laughs> look on Dump's face, you would have been pleased. Yes. As for myself, uh, tomorrow we are going to continue our normal streaming schedule. So tomorrow we've got Dungeons & Dragons Death of the Deities that will be going on at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you like Dungeons & Dragons, stop on by. Thursday, we're going to be playing a game as a podcast. And I believe it's Day Z, correct? Thursday. Perfect. So Thursday, you can catch us around the same time uh, playing some Day Z as a group, which has been a blast. And Red, I promise, okay, I won't kill you this time. Don't make promise. promises that you know you can't keep. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday, we're going to be playing our heavily modded survival Fallout 4 playthrough, followed by Saturday at 10 a.m. We've got Fallout 2D20, which is a tabletop role playing game. And then hopefully, if I can have a ride available, since my car is down, some space engineers later that night. But today, on today's episode, we're going to be revisiting a title that released in February called Sons of the Forest. Now, back when Minecraft released, early access gaming was kind of a rare thing, and now it's very common. But as the trend to alpha releasing titles becomes more and more common, so does our concern. Is this game going to release? Is it going to be playable when it first comes out to alpha? And when you think about the forest, there were a lot of crashed desktop errors, a lot of missing content, and the forest was really slow to hit that maturity point where you could sit back and think this is a great game. Well, we felt the same when we played Sons of the Forest when it first came out. 
a little rough around the edges, missing some elements, but I'm happy to say that in the short amount of months since its release in February, it has improved so much. It has seen some quality of life updates that has made the game incredibly fun, and unlike the forest, we didn't have to wait a year for it. Last week, we returned to the Sons of the Forest in what I like to call Base Camp Down. Uh, my friends uh, and I were playing together, and Dimension and I had stayed on while Dump had to log off. You know, you think you would be able to trust us with everything that we're doing on the base, but unfortunately, as soon as Dump Crawl left, our base was attacked, and we lost a lot of the structures and defenses <coughs> that were constructed. So, Dump, I apologize for that. Hopefully, you're not too mad at us. <laughs> still have my fish trap. I was okay. <laughs> you still have your fish trap? Well, I think a lot of it, I, I immediately hit the books. I don't know about you, because the, sup the super mutants, wow, fall out on the brain. The cannibals don't really react the same way they did in the forest. I did techniques and tricks that worked in the forest one, but turns out that did not deter them all. In fact, not only did they invade us with a fury, they also stepped around all of our spike traps and just blew up everything that we loved and held dear. We just got done building a third water collector when one of those bozos destroyed it and we couldn't find our turtle shell again. So I was very nervous that Dump was going to come back very upset. Uh, no, but you didn't. <laughs> I just laughed really hard when you pointed out that no, putting their friends' heads on spikes doesn't make them scared. It just draws them in. Who would have thought? Yeah. Now you could hold the head and that scares some of the little ones, but it just made the really big red guys very upset with us. <laughs> we were not prepared. But uh, I think the interesting thing too about the defenses not working is that there's nothing wrong with the spike defenses we put around our base. Uh, in fact, we can just ask Red. Red, those defenses work pretty good, didn't they? Oh, they're very effective, especially if it's a little bit dark and you're not looking where you're walking. So we had surrounded our base in the stick traps, thinking that that would protect us. But every time we got water or we were entering the base and they were hidden behind a bush, we had to pick each other up at least eight or nine times. Between Can somebody the help me? I'm down again. I stepped now, on this spike trap. I totally agree. The, the, the sticks, the sharpened sticks did such a good. I think they even made an impact on us. Oof. Okay, and just so you all know, this will be the last episode that Dump Crawl will be part of the State of Survival podcast. <laughs> I think it, at no, this but... point, it's where we insert the obligatory Monty Python. I want to learn how to be def or defend against a pointed stick. Nope, we're doing yeah. fruit today. Uh, all I could say is, I don't know who's replacing the stick traps, but you can stop now because there were some vertical ones that were not <laughs> sharpened. Dump, are you sick? You see the three of us struggling with this, and you're just like, well, we're just going to replace it here. Because with how many times we died, they shouldn't be around anymore. <laughs> well, I think they do their job. <laughs> you just don't know how to do yours. You just walk around. Okay, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember that when you go down next time we play, and I'm going to be like, oh, what's wrong, Dump? You were sleeping on the job again? <laughs> no, but you know what? that other, brings um, up a... Go, no, no, go. No, it brings up a good point. Uh, I kind of wish they wanted um, they added the ability for us to crawl. That way, when I do do it, I can crawl myself to drowning because I know y'all's just going to look at me the entire time. Oh, buddy, did you get stuck? Aww, Aww. Do you need to be picked up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. But uh, we, we immediately had to address the first problem when we started the live stream, which was our lack of potable drinking water. And uh, our surprising lack of food, because we had actually stocked up for drying racks of fish, but that was the first thing the mutants went after, and we lost it all. And then Red joins us, brand new to the game, and we don't have food for them. So that's the first thing we had to hop onto, was trying to get some food and uh, get everything taken care of. What do you think, uh, compared to the first time we played, what do you think about how hard it is to get food? Well, I actually enjoy, well, it is a lot harder. And the reason why it's harder is that the food isn't, I would say, scarce. But in the beginning, it's quite difficult to make sure we get the right food at the right time. Because food right. spoils pretty quickly. And 
it almost felt like because water damages us, that was actually our harder hurdle. Like getting food was a barrier, but actually staying hydrated well enough not to be really low on health was I think one of our hardest issues because every time we drank, we lost most of our health. I mean, we literally That's played a, the buddy program where I would drink until I went down and then your elbow would pick me back up and then I would do it again. And we literally had to almost gain that mechanic in so many words to actually be able to get hydrated. And that's not me saying it's too hard. That's me saying that there's actually a punishment for not properly exploring and finding what you need to possibly get cleaner water. Yeah, and we were using the food like health potions. We were getting hurt so much from drinking the water from the stream that we were eating food just to heal. And uh, we were burning through food way too fast. So Red had logged off once we got our situation at camp set up and we went out looking for food, hunted some seagulls and stuff. And that is when we had a Eureka discovery of a lifetime. We went out and found this camp. What? There, were, there had to have been, if I'm not over-exaggerating, at least 15 mutants by that human camp. Yeah. I mean, it I was, was all, nuts. Oh. Yeah, we found, I looked down, I see a cooking pot. I'm like, oh, that's cute. But I saw I could pick it up. And I'm like, dump. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so we're you bringing, know, it was crazy. We're bringing three cooking pots back to camp, which I'm going to put one in the fireplace where it will permanently stay. So we could take it out, fill it up with water, boil the water, and we can make mushroom soups with them and stuff, which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, you know what? Let's go ahead and hit to our hot takes because I can see this conversation bleeding into our main topic and we'll revisit this in just a second. So I will go ahead and start first with the hot takes. Um, I have been keeping my eye on Project Zomboid. We are all super excited for Build 42 to come out. And even if that means that NPCs will be live in Build 43 instead of Build 42, there's a lot of improvements they're bringing to the game. And one of the things that they commented on was the tech improvements they're bringing to the engine. Uh, they've got a 32 floor limit, which starts obviously underground. Uh, so there is a chance you're going to see 10 to 20 story buildings in the game once everything's said and done. They've enhanced the lighting and they've changed the tile size down to eight by eight chunks, which improves the speed at which those things load in. But my favorite thing about it, 4K, fully zoomed out. The devs are getting 300 FPS, which is phenomenal if you're trying to drive and you want to be able to look further ahead. I'm going to go ahead and uh, for those of you who are watching YouTube, I'm going to post a link to that blog. Check it out. Project Zomboid devs also put out a video of them demonstrating their zooming out and the performance doesn't lose a single frame per second, which I think is huge. And uh, that's all I got for my hot take. Just a little more news on Project Zomboid and the progress they're making. Oh, what about you, Dump? Well, my hot take is a little bit different than normal. It doesn't really have anything to do with survival games per se, but it does have to do with welcoming a new podcast that just started up, that's been in the works for a little bit, called The Sisters of Survival. Now, if you are a Daisy fan or enjoy the Daisy game overall, you'll be happy to hear that a bunch of lady streamers has decided to band together and make a podcast about Daisy itself. Now they are called the Sisters of Survival and their first episode was this last Sunday. Now the episode Ooh. that they had aired has not been fully published yet for public viewing after the live episode ended, but me and Red were able to attend and were able to watch it and we have to say that they are definitely up and coming and you guys should definitely give them a chance. I'm going to go ahead and post the link in our chat but if you are listening in spotify or apple the link will be down below in our description as well if you wish to go and look at them awesome awesome oh man like normal i unfortunately am a silly man and for some reason my thing did not copyright so i will uh fix that go ahead uh -huh, broken link all right well let's go ahead and take it off to our main discussion so one of the things that we decided to talk about when it came to Sons of the Forest was, is it a survival game? 
we wanted to ask our viewers what do you think about the progress being made so far uh, now that it's in early access and are they kind of impressing you based off of their performance with the forest i'd like to definitely hear what you guys think as we continue on with our podcast today uh but our first subject is what was missing when the game first released in our eyes uh there was definitely one thing i noticed water you could drink it no matter where you found it unless you found it from the ocean so any stream you could just drink from it there were no ramifications and it always bothers me when there's not dangerous water that you have to fix you know it's if it's all potable some of that difficulty curve goes away uh what was one of the things that you noticed when it first came out that kind of ruffle your feathers dump um i think it was honestly no fall damage that was kind of weird well, like, of I have kind. a clip on my channel that says a week later they fixed that. <laughs> hey, we're talking about right. when it first dropped here, buddy. Don't you dare. I know. Me. No, no, you're right. Because the first time we played, we were like, no fall damage. And we were jumping from cliffs and bounding down the mountain to get to our campsite. And, uh, of course, you know, we could have chosen not to exploit that. But that's that's part of it. You know, being able to fall five stories until your legs break. No problem. I felt like I was playing Daisy Expansion on the first week, uh, first week again. <laughs> All right, we got a comment from Tweaks. Yes, I like the more realism as well as those issues are definitely something I agree with. Yeah, the realism is key. That's it's one thing that the forest was missing that I enjoyed from the final product was the realism of the forest. And I had almost assumed that Sons of the Forest would just kind of carry those survival difficulty onto the next one, but no dice. It was kind of a, a weird experience playing on the hardest setting and not having that happen. Yeah, it was. I, th I think the other thing we noticed was that fish weren't working properly. So we found fish in the stream up at the river, but we weren't finding them in the lakes and the fish traps weren't catching anything, which was probably the worst part of it. Yeah, that was very problematic because it definitely made us have to travel up and down the rivers, but it also it didn't make a lot of sense as that fish don't always overpopulate in lakes, but not being able to find a single one, it was kind of problematic. Yeah, especially since hunting deer in this one's a lot harder than hunting deer in the first game. I think the AI has been improved quite a bit. So just being able to eat fish really changed things. Uh, we also noticed that trees didn't do any damage when they fell on you in the beginning, which was kind of a bummer because that's the best part of the forest one, especially when there's like the dominoes effect in the forest of all the trees falling. <laughs> What's wrong, Dub? You sound like you got some personal experience where that may have doomed you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. No. All right, I, I do. It was on my own personal Sons of the Forest gameplay. Um, the tree hitbox is a little bit too big. I literally cut down a tree and there's like a big girth about like about like another tree's distance from my base building object. It fell down right next to the thing about, you know, a tree away and it destroyed like the entire right hand side of my building. Like, just oh. and I'm all like, that sucks. But, you know, at the same time, I'm cool that they're adding that mechanic where it's actually affecting buildings or base mm -hmm. building stuff. But it, it, I think the hitbox is a little bit too big. Could have been a glitch. I could be just a whiny little shit, but I don't think so. I would like to test that though next time we play. Let's uh, build a small log cabin and have dimensions sit in it, and we'll cut trees next to cabin and see how close those trees can land to the cabin before dimension dies. Also, it's funny just to kill your friends. But the other thing that I've uh, had a problem with when it first came out was the performance. Uh, when it first came out, even those of us with really good gaming PCs, it was chunking a little bit in areas that it shouldn't. Uh, and it was kind of a disappointment, you know. Performance issues like that, I understand if it's kind of a fluke, but we played for three weeks straight without much improvement. So it's nice to see I, that those have been relieved. You're totally right. Uh, one of the things I can say, folks, is that I have a... Uh... Wow, I just totally forgot what my GPU is. No, as um, it turns out, folks, he can't say. <laughs> uh, but I have uh, not a very powerful computer, but I have an okay computer. It can run most things. It can do pretty well. 
But even my, um, wow, I am even blanking on my own um, silliness here. I know, right? I'm using my words. And I need to use my words. My 2060 Super uh, RTX actually had a really hard time actually even rendering this at the lowest of settings, the Sons of the Forest. Mm -hmm. I know I couldn't even stream it in the very beginning, Arl, because it just was too taxing on my system. And folks, I have a two computer cop set up. So I have one computer that handles all the encoding, streaming, and all that stuff for me. And then I have my gaming PC, which sends all that information over there, but it handles all, all of the stuff. And uh, it, it couldn't do it. And I went to stream with Yarl the other day, and it was like, what's this? Let's keep going. I had no problem. Yeah. So yes, Yarl, huge improvements in um, optimization performance. I remember when we first were playing it, I had to go to NVIDIA control panel, and instead of using my global settings, I had to set specified parameters for Sons of the Forest to even get it to work. And I was still dealing with flickering trees on the hillsides, which was very yeah. distracting, but... Which moves us to our next point. What has been implemented that you noticed that made the game feel more like a survival game and less like a horror game? Okay. Okay. Well, there are a couple of interesting situations here. One of them was, we can catch fish now in fish traps. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they can catch up to six. Isn't that what you discovered? Yeah. Definitely. Um, the other thing that I think I have noticed is that... Um, I believe the mutants or whatever they are, uh, are actually not necessarily smarter, but they're more hesitant now. Like, I am actually seeing them actually block and go at me right after, after they block. And even if I attack them when they block, sometimes they don't immediately attack back. So the attack pattern is sporadic enough, I don't actually feel like I can predict how to beat this one NPC the same way every time. I used mo more Molotovs, grenades, spears, and whatever I had to throw at them than I did previously when we were playing. Because previously, we were just running around with our little survival axes going, ha ha ha! But now, yeah, we I feel like I'm pulling everything out of my arsenal. Like, I'm literally all like, grenade! And instead of saying grenade, folks, I said run because that was the only thing i could think of <laughs> hey we did we just ran in different directions <laughs> i think y'all you ran to it i did i actually so you said run and i'm like oh i thought something was behind me so i just took off running and i stopped to turn around and i see this thing fly out of my peripheral and i looked down just in time to see the grenade <gasps> and that was it i was down <laughs> yeah. no but you're right about the thing about the AI that's interesting is they didn't just go, okay, let's make the AI smarter and turn the cannibals into sniper killers, right? We noticed it in our base camp almost right away. In the forest one, right, in uh, in the, uh, let's see, I was going to say the forest one, but it's called the forest. <laughs> in the forest, we had found that one center island, right? That's got the, the river kind of snaking around it. Um, the one thing that really bothered me about the first game is they don't like water. So on that center island where we were all building, they would just stand on the beach going, ah, 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 and scream at you, but they weren't a threat. You could throw pebbles at them and laugh at them. And we had assumed that when we started playing, that as long as we had water, we could build our defenses on one side and be completely safe. We were wrong. They will find a way across that water, whether it's jumping from tree to tree, they will find a way to get to you if they can. Yeah. It's very frustrating. <laughs> Definitely. They, they, they really know how to do that, exactly what you said, jump tree from tree. And if you're walking around your base camp and you're not paying attention, they will drop on you and you won't even know that, that that's what happened. Um, they're, it's no longer just the monkeys, the, the, can, the cannibals or mutants or whatever they are literally do the same exact thing yeah i was surprised when you're like they're in the trees i'm thinking oh you mean the scaredy golems that's what i call them because they're always walking on the hands of force you're like no y'all and i look up and i see the big ones are in the trees and i'm like well what am i supposed to do now like how do we defend against this oh uh, well, i actually know dimension did believe me i'm like they're on the trees he's like no they're not and i shot one with an arrow and it falls out of the tree which is cool like it literally goes ah, and it falls down and it falls right in front of dimension he's like oh 
<laughs> yeah, poor dimension. So many things happened that stream that was just hilarious. And this one, for me anyway, is an up and a down. And I think the fellows with state of survival can definitely agree with this. The up, water now hurts you if you don't boil it or treat it. The down, you just go ugh and lose health. There's no other negative effects. And I wanted to turn it to red and dump. If you could install a negative effect from drinking uh, undrinkable water, how would you do it? I would go for... Uh, now, I actually thought about this because we talked about this a while ago. And it was just briefly suggested. And I kind of changed my mind on this. I would like to see maybe a negative, a negative ailment given to you for a short amount of time. When that negative ailment, in my eyes, would be is a lack of a loss of food nutrition when eating so let's say mm. for example food gives you like i don't know two bars when you eat it how about if you are suffering the effects of poisoned water you only get one bar of food so it really makes you go question do i really want to drink this dirty water before eating my meal maybe not that's and i point. would i would say <clears throat> kind of looking at it from the let's look at realism and then kind of back back into it from there what happens if you drink um water out of a puddle well there's two maybe three outcomes since we really don't have a a disease thing going on we'll leave that one out and then it's you're going to throw up or it's going to be coming out the other end since we don't have the other end covered yeah. i guess we have it covered but it's not part of the game I think that uh, you run a risk of throwing up and then you also lose um, some food that you have in your stomach as well. Yes. Now, see, I'm on board with that because you and I had talked about it before. I do like the idea of dub gras as far as immersion goes, because that absolutely makes sense that there'd be some parasites in there that would keep it's harder to get that nutrition. But yeah. I thought an easy fix would be what they did in the forest one when you ate raw food, that if you drink too much bad water, there's a chance that she'll just be like, and then lose water and food. So it's kind yeah. of a gamble, it makes you have to go out. But honestly, I kind of think we should do both. Maybe before you throw up, you have a chance to either vomit and lose both food and water or make it to where food is not as effective until you can get that water out of your system. That would be a really good idea. That's cool. Yeah. So if we do that, my next question is, would you guys like to see charcoal tablets implemented or something um, along that type? Yeah, maybe charcoal, maybe like a little Pepto or bicarb or something that could be a treatment. Maybe not an immediate fix, but something that might uh, help alleviate some of the symptoms. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I, I really like the idea of that. Um, I had talked to one of my friends who also plays Sons of the Forest, and they said that they think that your energies should be zapped. Mm. So you need more sleep. Uh, that was a good idea, too. But when you're playing multiplayer, it's not ideal because you can't just lay in the bed and rest. Uh, but it would be nice to see some of those mechanics come to the front. Um, the other thing that they've improved is the mutants themselves. Uh, since release, they've added a couple more boss variants that you encounter underground. And they are absolutely terrifying. And that was one of the things I missed when it first came out. Of course, one of the biggest ones that you don't see in Sons of the Forest are the Virginias. Like, there is a Virginia, but there was a cannibal called the Virginia, and those things were terrifying. They had, like, six legs, three torsos sewn together absolutely terrifying well the twins are back and a few of the other uh infected are or infected <laughs> cannibals are back and uh, we're going to see more variety with those cannibals and i'm hoping that if we progress more we'll see them on the surface instead of just underground yeah definitely i know on my single player playthrough i have seen the worm or whatever it is i call it earthworm gym i don't know why i just do but um it it's terrifying when it happened because it literally, I have, you know, you can do the log barricades. Uh, it literally just went over them and mm -hmm. started destroying my entire place. And I'm throwing Molotovs at it, uh, grenades, which are destroying more of my defenses. The thing is, though, is it actually came in and I couldn't get rid of it. It was destroying my main base. So when I threw a grenade and I missed, it blew up my wall and they were waiting outside the regular ones. Like, they knew that was going to cause chaos and they were waiting for it to either break the walls or for me to be stupid enough to break my own walls. 
And once that right. happened, they came flooding in. Because I had my entire base surrounded with traps and, you know, st stick spikes, which I never step on. Um, <clears throat> why? Um, but, uh... <laughs> but, they were waiting. That's also part of the uh, mutant AI that you were talking about. They're smart enough to know that they can't get past my defenses, so they waited for their worm guy to break it for them so they could. And that was a really interesting thing. You want to know what Puppy did when the game first came out? Uh, we play with a streamer named Puppyatron, and she came up with this defensive system for the worms. She put all the spikes pointed towards our base, lined it with stone, and then so we have those, and then she put the fly swatter trap about six feet away from it. So when the worm came over, it would hurt itself on the spike trap. The fly swatter trap would then slam it into the spikes. It was really effective. That's um, smart. And one of the traps they've added to the game is now the spring trap, where you can put the turtle shell down. And, oh, Dump, do you like corpse launches? Of course. We need to build those, my friend. I saw them while I was researching the episode this week. I saw people using them and watching the big red mutant be like, Ugh step on the spring trap and just ragdoll up in the air over the tree line. Oh, <laughs> I need those in my life. And uh, we just don't tell Red where they are because that would be really funny. Oh, definitely, definitely. Give revenge for the skydive trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was one point where we all got destroyed, like absolutely got murdered. And we got taken to that one camp where we had to free ourselves. And in that camp, we found this really cool unicycle high-tech Segway called the Night Five. And I know we had a lot of fun with it. I rode mine maybe 15 feet before hitting a log and I took flight and it hurt a lot. So I don't trust myself with the Night Five. I gave mine to Dimension. Uh, but what were your guys' thoughts on the Night Five? Was that not really fitting in a survival game or did you find it a fun vehicle to use? I found it interesting because it did portray um, a level of mobility, like it wasn't a big hulking vehicle that was very difficult to move around in. But although I was able to get accustomed to it, it took me a little bit. I will have to say, I don't think that thing could go over most of that terrain. I'm sorry. Realistically, mm -hmm. I think that thing would get stuck so much. And it was cool. They had the cool animation where if you hit something too hard, you would go diving over it. But... I don't think realistically it really works. I think it needs to be That's a fair. lot more rugged, like a bigger, more off-road tire for it to actually even think about working. How about you, Red? What was your thoughts on it? <laughs> yeah, I would agree. It was when I saw it, I was like, what the devil is this? And uh, I, I've ridden one of those before in real life. And knowing the challenges just on flat terrain and then like Dump was saying, trying to maneuver like the picture here has it on sand which it really did well on sand uh or you know where there's roots and kind of uneven ground it's like yeah it's not happening i would say it was a little bit seemed out of place but then as i look at kind of the overall sons of the forest what's going on in it there are definitely some weird things that feel like they're out of place but are just kind of like well that's sons of the forest i guess I mean, so. I agree. And and in Sons of the Forest, you find wreckages of golf carts everywhere. I, I almost would have rather had a golf cart. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. But, but kind of to give you guys some validity on that opinion, because I feel the same. I, I honestly felt like it was too much. If you were going to struggle your way through a forest with that thing, or even if it performed well in the forest, I don't know if I'd want to use it. I think it would take away from the struggle. But... There are five different locations where you could find one. So apparently we're not the only ones that are having a hard time getting these things stuck in places. Ah, oh, but it's good. Uh, they've added some things that people have been asking for. When Sons of the Forest first was releasing and they did their gameplay reveal, they showed people in tactical armor with rifles and pistols with night vision goggles. And when it released, there were no night vision goggles. But now there are. I love the idea of night vision goggles, especially with how easy it is to get that tech nowadays. I mean, you can go to a toy store and get a decent set of basic night vision goggles. And I do like the fact that they're implementing it, especially since in this game, 
The enemies can be vertical. Do you guys think that teeters too much in the... Does it take away from the survival experience for you guys to have something like night vision? Uh, I, I, for me, it does, yes. I mean, that's it's something that I know in playing DayZ, I don't really like playing at night without night vision, just being kind of a wuss about it. But if I was really wanting to get into the survival mode, night vision goggles wouldn't play a part of it. Right. Uh, I'm indifferent about it. If anything, I kind of lean towards it's actually an okay thing. The reason why is because Sons of the Forest, while it is a survival game, it's a survival against the PvE mechanics. The mutants going exploring, and it's about trying to find out more about the island. As we saw Jarl and Red even saw it himself, the mutants' attacks became more and more aggressive the more and more we fought them back. And I don't think that's going to change. So night vision goggles actually become, I wouldn't say necessarily 100% useful or uh, needed, but they are what you would call a edge. They give you a little bit more of a higher senses, a better way of attacking. Because the Sons of the Force Wall is a survival game in my view, I also view it as a progression, uh, a complete progression. And it's not always about being stuck in the mud. Because we have 3D printers, we have the little motorboat bike things that we all agreed probably wouldn't fit. And so many other mm -hmm. things like golf carts and boats. You know, we even made fun of somebody for having champagne and stuff on the thing and they're dead. <laughs> you were, we were ragging on them. Oh, looks yeah, like we got I, another comment here. Uh, Tweak says, yes, I think torches are enough, but I love the more survival hardcore aspect. I 100% agree with you. Now I have a hype. I'd like to counteract this. I felt the same way when I saw they added night vision goggles, but then I thought about it. The mutants become more aggressive at night, and that's when the more dangerous mutants like to show up. So realistically, most people are going to bed down for the night, especially since energy is huge about that. But I think the night vision goggles purpose, especially with the scarcity of batteries, is actually going to be more for the caves than they're actually be intended to be worn on the surface. But even then, I was thinking about it. How many times have we explored those caves in Sons of the Forest where it's pitch black and then you come in a room and there's a bright light, one bright light that's just shining up the room. That is going to make night vision horrible. <laughs> oh, man. man. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of a toss up, right? Like, you know, you're really supposed to be surviving, but you also want to be a person who feels like eventually you're not getting 100% the edge on every environment. And I think night vision goggles is a good in-between on that, especially since Sons of the Forest is, again, more of a PvE game. Uh, if yeah. it was a pure PvP game, I feel like, eh, I'm okay with it if, it, um, um, if it's really rare. But being a pure PvE game, I can actually see it being quite useful. Yeah, and I think if there are... I mean, we haven't found them in the wild yet, but if you have to craft them at the 3D printer, the things you craft at that 3D printer take a lot of resin. Resin and batteries are a finite resource. So if you have to craft them with resin, totally makes sense. You're sacrificing your ability to craft something else that could be beneficial. But again, I really only see us using it in the caves because I would be so mad if Red and I are back at camp, ready to go to bed, but Dump is out hunting with his night vision goggles going, I'm fine, I've got night vision. <laughs> oh, I would be very salty when Dump got back. There would be some rotten fish in his bed for sure. <laughs> Sounds fishy. Now, the other... <laughs> I, I hate you sometimes. <laughs> the other hey, thing that fish I in my bed. Is, uh... you already established that. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Okay, I'm the bad guy. You're right. The other thing that I noticed is that, well, first of all, hooray, we got our log slag back and we were able to build an upgraded one with skull lanterns in the front so we could use it at night. And my goodness, it is so nice. Even after the forest's official release, the log sled was so buggy. It would go through the map, fall from the sky, go through the map. It's so nice to see that the log sled is performing like it should. Uh, and I was very pleased with that. But the other thing that they've added is solar panels and actual lights that you could put at your base. So it'll be interesting to see what we do with those, because I know the more lights you have, the 
there's no point in having that many if you only have a couple solar panels. And in the winter, the solar panels don't do much. So you can't really rely on it. But they have really just kind of in the last few months added so much that changes the way that you could play the game. No, definitely. Um, they've added new animals. We'll just kind of list some of these and talk about them. New animals, I haven't seen too many of them. I'm still mad that you can't eat the little birds when you kill them. Um, that would be nice if they at least dropped a little piece of meat. Seagulls are fair game, though. They obviously added the cooking pot, but with the cooking pot comes a completely new cooking system, being able to make soups, stews, and, and boiled meats. So it'll be fun to combine some of those berries and stuff that we've been finding, some of the mushrooms that we've been looking up to make some food that everybody can drink from one pot and get a lot of hunger. Uh, well, not a lot of hunger. I guess fill up a lot of hunger. Now, the other things they've added to the game, drones and VR headsets to fly, fly the drones. And at first I was like, that is the dumbest thing. But honestly, in the last couple of years, we're going to have to come to the terms that if we're at a high tech island, they would be bound to use drones. I mean, even law enforcement and rescue like wilderness rescue are using drones and drones are so affordable and easy for people to use without any training. I don't really see it's out of the realm of possibility to find drones on a vacation island like this. He shoots, he scores! What do you guys think about the addition of drones? I'm really interested in what Dump has to say about this. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at Dump's angry Mr. Feeny face. Uh, how do you feel about the drones? <laughs> Why don't you tell me about that? You, know, you called me out here, so we're going to have to go that route. <laughs> hey guys, these are prescription. They aren't just props. So, okay. If you guys are going to have slight issues with night vision goggles, you can take all this uh, VR or drones and toss it out the window. But if you guys are willing to accept that uh, night vision goggles might be very possible on a high tech island, like you're all said, these actually might make a lot of sense. Now, do I think that these things should be easy to find? No. Do I think that they're going to be incredibly useful? Yes. The question is: is will the drones, like the uh, therm, um, the night vision goggles and the flashlights? take batteries. I actually want something I want to bring up about the night vision uh, goggles. You know, I'm taking these off. They're bugging me. Uh, I love that, your um actually it, moment, though. You're like, um, actually? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, there's a flashlight, a full-fledged Mac flashlight. You know, the ones that look like you can bash someone's skull in um, in the game. And that literally eats batteries. Like, I think I went through three packs trying to explore a cave and then crying like a baby once I saw I don't know what I saw, but it was scary. Um, but I think night vision goggles and these drones definitely are going to be battery eater. And you find batteries all the time. But if you're going to be going through batteries like crazy, it definitely makes these items quite limited, which is actually kind of what you want. They're there, but do you have the power to use them? Who knows? I think you yeah, hit the nail on the head there, there dump with that because uh you know, as I was thinking in this, this kind of environment, there's going, there is always going to be a limited number of batteries. You know, even though realistically mm -hmm. the game is respawning them and blah blah blah. But, but when you try to throw that realism factor on, you're on there with a limited number of batteries. It's not like you can take uh, lemons and a couple of nails and, you know, make your own little uh, homemade batteries or something. So those are going to be a very finite resource and something that. You know, they, they could be, the, the electronic devices could be a little bit more OP if the batteries were more scarce. And uh, yeah, especially if you use them up quickly, like Dump was saying, in a in a uh, mag light. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I don't have any more batteries. I can't fly my drone. Now, I can't confirm this until we get our hands on one. But one thing I've noticed is those cases that you open up in the wild to loot from, they don't always respawn for you. A lot of the times, once oh. you've opened them, they're open for you. Some of them do respawn in certain areas, uh, but you're not going to be able to go to a cave and refarm those high value crates by returning to the cave every time you can. I do like that. I also nice. saw some of the footage from the drone. It very much looks like drone footage. It's not very high quality, but the thing that I 
think will affect it the most, and I'm getting a lot of people saying it does, is the scenery and terrain will affect your radio signal. So if you're standing in a bunch of trees trying to fly a drone, you won't be able to go far before it starts losing radio strength. Whereas if you're standing on top of the mountain, you could probably get quite a distance with it. So it's all really nice things to consider. I, for one, don't have a problem with it, with the exception of what are we looking for? If you're using a drone, you know, uh, are we looking for the individual mutants running around the trees? We already know they're out there. So I'm wondering if the drones more for scouting for camps, scouting for animals, because they're going real big on the hunting in these next few updates or just making sure that there's no cannibal camps up ahead so you could avoid them. Oh. So it'll be interesting to see how it's used. But I think it's going to be like that one sled you could get that you 3D print where it takes up a special spot in your inventory. I don't think you're going to be able to have the sled and the drone and the, you know, I think it's one of those tech devices that's going to be like your specialty if you choose that one. I'll have to see when I get my hands on it, though. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I wonder if you can um, use it to explore caves. Now, see, if they did that, I'd be OK with it if you were really nearby. Like if you're in one cave room and you go into the next one. But underground, I would imagine that would affect it pretty good. I remember taking my dad used to take me uh, and my RC car into a parking garage. Worked great. But because of the nature of the parking garage, after a certain distance, it would start to get intermittent radio signal. So be kind of interesting to see how the caves play into that um now what i want to know is can we put grenades on it can we drop stuff from it can we carry stuff with it because if that's the case no, that's no, dumb. No, no. don't do that hey, yeah what about what about fly by wire drones uh and, no uh, i cave. hate fly by wire <laughs> i know I think of, think of how cool that would be you get enough wire you could literally fly the drone around and of course you could okay you, you mean you actually wire putting wire up okay i thought you meant fly by wire like that's just the nature of the game i was so upset when i first got kingdom hearts as a kid and saw that the gummy ships were fly by wire and i was like i'm not playing this <laughs> no i mean like that would be a, interesting thing, it's a thing my dad did with uh his old electric um airplanes model ones we literally would attach a wire to it and it would feed the electricity and the uh, control signals to it. My dad had an older one. And that's how he used to fly it around, was by a wire connected to it. Now, you're talking about and the ones where you hold it and then you turn, you spin around, and it's basically flying in a circle? Or are you talking about a spooled out wire that... Spooled out wire. Interesting. It was hmm. a full-fledged thing. And that's how it worked. It sent a, sent a full-fledged electrical signal and it powered it. Um, and we, you could fly it for hours. It was a lot of fun because, you know, you just plugged it in. But, uh, you know, you had to then rewind the wire, which it didn't right. eventually would kink it or break it or whatever. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah, Gumby's Adam got models. a good point in uh, Chad oh. that uh, the term, we're misusing the term. Um, it's actually wire guided. Fly by wire has a different meaning in aeronautics, where it's you're not using hydraulics or uh, pulley and cable you're actually using electronics and that's running servos. So just yeah, to be and I perfectly that video clear. Game term, in the video game term, fly by wire is like those really early Star Wars games where the camera is on a set path and all you're doing is flying the ship around obstacles. So I was totally confused. But now that you said that, that brings me back to so much nostalgia. I went to a World War One museum on the East Coast and I bought a Zeppelin that had little propellers and it had a wire. A, like a, a 15 foot wire that would attach to the remote and i'd be sitting here going oh so cool but yeah oh man we're old dumb that was back before wireless technologies reached a level that were common <laughs> so uh my next excited thing hasn't happened yet but it's coming very soon with their expansion of the extra animals in sons of the forest the next two that are slated to release are bears and wolves. I don't know how to feel about that because we don't even have a gun yet. We're throwing sticks at people. <laughs> uh, so is well, this going to be we, can... we see a grizzly and run? No, 
Hey, Dimension, you throw a couple spears at it, you'll kill it. Where are you guys going? <laughs> you got this, buddy. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> no, I think it's going to be cool. Now, I would like to see us uh, bears have territory. And what I mean by that is, in the wild, bears don't necessarily give a flying F about you unless they're either really hungry or you're mm -hmm. encroaching upon something they hold safe which is maybe cubs or something else. Um, and I would think it'd be cool if, like, there were essentially, like, areas that you always saw the bear kind of, like, hanging around. And, yeah, it would go further out. Like, if a bear came by your camp, it wouldn't necessarily attack you. But if you went and followed the bear possibly to back where it came from, it might turn at you eventually after so much time and be all like, what the hell are you doing? And then get kind of aggressive with you. And right. you may attack it on accident, and then guess what? Bob's your uncle. Well, that that's a very good point. And when you camp up here in the Pacific Northwest, the first thing they tell you is don't pick camp near a water source. They go there for water and fishing. And don't camp near where there's a bunch of berries, because they eat that too. You want to set your camp to where you have to walk to your water source and not have it by any obvious source of food or water. And it would be kind of cool to see the bears in the lowlands, because I don't think they'd be in the mountains. Um, they'd be in the lowlands areas near all the water and stuff. So these ideal campsites you see in Sons of the Forest on YouTube all the time, like the lake we were at, would not be safe just because the bears would be roaming. Now, well, um, embellishing upon that, think about how you were talking about how the mutants don't like water. Imagine how much of a how much of a meta that would change if you couldn't camp near the water very easily because the bears would always be nearby. Mm -hmm. So you camp further away, which guess what? Means that water no longer is your natural defense. And how cool would it be if they give the wolves actual wolf hunting techniques where the wolves will stalk you, but they won't come in for the kill until the mutants soften you up. That right. would be so cool. Um, I i've been stalked by wolves before they they wait until you show a sign of weakness they don't just go oh look there's a couple humans i'm gonna attack them they will follow you for a very very long time waiting for you to take a break or wear down no, but it really would be so interesting. interesting if they're opportunistic no you're totally right that's really cool one of the things that i think would be cool to see from them too is uh oh, come on i i, I just did I, I just had it <laughs> I'm spacing a lot today, guys. Wow, look at that. Um, it's, um, oh, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of Jurassic Park, uh, the very first movie, where wolves kind of act like this, like the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park, where, like, one of them baits him to go after it, and then, like, he, remember the folk when he calls it Clever Girl? That's actually something you can see from very hungry wolves. They will purposely set up traps for you. Um, mm -hmm. and they'll try to separate you from your group. That's kind of how they work with other wild animals. So, yeah, I would love to see those kind of tactics, those kind of yeah. scary and things. Think about in the wintertime when you don't have fish and everybody's starving to death, but you see a wolf and you're like, all right, y'all, go get the wolf. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's just running away from me, leading me further into the woods. And then I turn around and I'm surrounded and you guys are like, you good over there? Y'all? <laughs> That'd be so good. Uh, but I think we've established that Red would have to be the first one to go after them every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, ar mm. I already shoot yeah. him every time we play Day Z, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Calm down, Peter Geller. I'm sorry. Jeez. Dang. But Honestly, one thing I would you know, like to. Oh, go ahead. I think we could just play G blame Gumpy in chat for that. I blame Gumby all the time. He's my scapegoat. It's always Gumby's fault. <laughs> Yay! So with that being said, now I want to turn the discussion over for a little bit to what changes would you like to see? If you could think of three changes or three additions to the game, what are the ones you'd like to see, Dumbra? I would like to see or I guess I would like to see better ways of handling your situational stuff from camping to all that stuff. There are so many cool things that we come across in these abandoned campsites. We're all like, I would totally take that and make something out of it. These abandoned chairs, golf clubs, you name it. 
If the island's going to be littered with this old stuff, why not let us make use of it? The golf carts, why not let us take the batteries out of them and help us with the solar panel batteries? Why not allow us to uh, take the leaf spring from the golf carts? Uh, folks, I'm not sure if you've ever actually made weapons out of leaf <laughs> spring, but they're really strong. They're um, brutal. But there are so many cool things we could do with, I would say, kind of the debris and trash uh, laid out. Uh, another thing I would like to do is please, please let us do something with the big bodies. Can we just chop up the big bodies in the game, YouTube, in the game, and allow us to pick up the parts and actually get rid of them? Because although the big guys do eventually despawn, it takes a little while, and they do ragdoll, which means you can see some interesting things happen. I've actually seen them on my own solo play, destroy um, my a part of my house because they got stuck in there and they do damage when they get stuck. Yeah, and uh, I think we had a couple times uh, really funny instances with the big red bodies. We had that one that was bent over, stuck on the spike trap suggestively, and we couldn't move it. So no matter which way we were looking in the camp, there was just this red eye of Sauron staring back at you uh, and we couldn't get rid of it we couldn't we couldn't hide oh, it man. we couldn't cover it with leaves but the other thing was later on Virginia ran into camp with Smalavera and she soccer kicked one of them and it was just like pew, boom, out in the atmosphere oh my god that was hilarious <laughs> oh we did just get a message in from Mr. Tweaks and it goes Mr. Tweaks, Tweaks goes death more sickness and meds adds more risk and if there will be Solar panels maybe add the ability to bid, build windmills and water mills. Mm. That would be cool. I, I cannot wait to get my hands on the solar panels because once you do, you start to see, you know, you and I were talking about all the blank spots in the survival book. It's like, what, what are all these blank squares for when you're cycling through? Those populate when you get the equipment used to build with them. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Uh, now, as far as... Uh, water mills and stuff go for i could see that working with like waterfalls or some other places but most of the rivers and sons of the forest don't travel fast enough to actually propel a water wheel well enough if anything i could see that as a way of like passively getting water into like a big barrel or something for like passive water for wa water collection but i don't think they could ever power something and windmills right I'm not sure if you'll be up uh, unless you build really high up. I'm not sure if you would get enough torque to actually grind or do other basic stuff. However, it is a high tech thing. So maybe you can make a basic windmill that produces power. Yeah, it would be kind of neat if at least the windmill would power a stove or, or, you know, like something like that to where you could build. Because as we discovered last time, fire does attract the mutants. They're not afraid of it anymore unless it's in a torch. Oh, yeah. Fire. Oh, worms! <laughs> um, I'll make fire. <laughs> I th I think a couple of the changes okay. I would make is please let us use the GPS and add custom map markers. That would be great. I would like now, that. Are you talking about outside of the GPS markers, we can already find and then replace. Or are yes. you talking about like like just own? go boop boop and make like a yarl one or a yarl two and be like hey at yarl two is the boiled the cooking pot so red if you want to go get it i've marked it something like that that would be really nice um what about you red i know you only played the one time but what are a couple things you would like to see brought to the game i was thinking right along the same lines that dump was god help me uh which is with hey the... wait wait man <laughs> what <laughs> Which is with the various uh, kind of tech scattered around the island and in, in various states of disrepair, being able to break it down into components to reuse them, I think that really adds mm -hmm. adds to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, or I, like I, even defensive things with the boats. Yep. Like putting them at the base of a wall. I mean, guys, it would totally fit into my Mr. Feeny vibe running after them with a golf club. <laughs> Well, I've got great news for you, Dump. I don't know if you're ready for this, but we actually have a reporter on the field who's going to give us an update on what's going on with the state of uh, the Sons of the Forest. So let's get over to our reporter on the field. Uh, are you there? Do, do we? Is it picking up? I don't know. Dump, why don't you try? Hello? Hello? Hey! You there? Kelvin, there do you hear us? There you are, Kelvin. Kel uh, Kelvin. Kelvin oh, hang on. Dead. Hang on one sec. I know I'm fixing it. 
Kelvin. Got some questions for you, buddy. Now, I know you've had your eardrums blown out. Oh, hang on. Uh, Kelvin, what is your opinion on the cooking pot added to the island? Yeah. Okay. I think that's a <laughs> thumbs up from our reporter on the field. Hang on. Kelvin, how do you find your audio working out for you? I know we had mic troubles in the beginning. HBU. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, thank you, uh, Kelvin. Get news. Bring to me. All right, you too, buddy. Thank you so much. Ah. Uh, oh man. So, uh, thank you very much to Kelvin. Although uh, he won't be able to hear me, but I just wanted to say that it's been a really fun episode. They made a lot of changes to the game, and. Feel free to comment on the video once it goes live. What do you all think about the progress that's being made with the game? What kind of direction would you like to see it go into? I'm pretty happy with what we have so far. And uh, I mean, we've just in our YouTube live chat here, we've had some really good ideas that I'd, I'd like to interrogate or interrogate, investigate more. Give me your ideas. Where are your ideas? I'm interrogating you now. Anyway, so Dump's having a brain farts and I can't say the right words. You know, we're... Uh, we're okay. Red's the one that is kind of the glue. <laughs> oh, right. here we go. We got oh, yeah. What, what we got? Uh, we got a comment. I'm not going to ruin the name, but Bush uh, says, Dump Graw, would you ever consider map making for DayZ? Your mods are great, and I'm sure if you wanted, you could really make a nice map. Oh, dump. I want to know. Would you All ever right. consider level uh, design? Bush, I will have to be honest. I don't want to touch map making with a 34 foot pole and 19 inches. Okay. Map making in Daisy is one of the most difficult and time consuming things you can ever do. And based off of the time that it takes to make a map, it's easily a year or longer investment. I've been modding for the past four years and I have purposely stayed away from map making for the reason that I don't believe I would do a good job, nor do I really have any true interest in it. And although, although I hate saying that I'm not interested in something, so I won't do it, I do believe having passion even a little bit about something makes it great. And I have no passion for map making. So unfortunately, the answer for me is no. But I do hope that you can find a map maker out there that is doing things. We have plenty of maps out there. Bitterroot, Deer Isle, Banop, Namalsk, and there are so many more being developed right and now. And a new one that released that you guys might be interested in if you check out the youtube channel fresh spawns they've been playing it on a lot they've been playing on it a lot lately they made a washington state map and it's actually really good <laughs> so there, there's a lot of maps that you can get your hands on but i totally yeah. get that dump i i did debugging for game design i love debugging i love fixing problems but i don't have the passion to code a game from scratch it's i could do it but I'd be forcing myself every step of the way, and it would just be a chore. Yeah, it would be, it would be a chore to further explain to Bush the reason why I think I also would take take me so long if I did have passion for it is because I would want to make my own buildings. I would want to make my own boulders for whatever that means to folks. I would want to make a custom map and not reuse vanilla assets. Of course, I would reuse vanilla assets here and there, like rocks and maybe trees here and there. But honestly, there are so many maps out there that just reuse vanilla assets. I think that if I ever made one, I would have to go a custom asset route. I couldn't just make a terrain and throw the old vanilla assets on. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up so we can hear what we're doing next week. Ah, uh, so today we covered the growth of Sons of the Forest, and it wasn't just to promote the game itself. It was to say that I'm really proud of the dev company for doing as well as they had, especially since the forest took so long to fine tune. I'm just glad we're not in that same development cycle. It makes me excited because I think that they've set the standard for some of the survival games that are going to be coming out early release this year onto how they should update the game and how frequently they should update the game. But 
Dump Graw, you're running next week's podcast episode. What can we look forward to? Well, you know, I kind of wanted to uh, point something out that I thought would be interesting to folks about Sons of the Forest before we close. I meant to bring it up a little bit earlier, so I do apologize. But, uh, folks, if you ever go looking for the Sons of the Forest website, it doesn't exist. It, they still have the Forest website out there, so don't be confused. That is the real publishers, and they are um, working on it and everything else. It's just they haven't made an official website for Sons of the Forest. So if you ever find that and you're a little bit confused, just know that it's it's that way. Um, but as for our next week's subject, it is going to be about Day Z. And folks, you're going to have to stay tuned to see what it is. Keep an eye on our Twitter, Instagram, threads, or wherever else you follow us. Because I'll be posting the details of that episode quite quickly here in a bit. We'll see you Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific time, as we all play DayZ together and talk about subjects that we want to broach on our next podcast. We'll see you then, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching our video and this podcast episode. Please like and subscribe, and it definitely helps us when you do. Please remember that you can also comment down below, and who knows, maybe we'll read or talk about your comment in our next episodes. Folks, I also want you to make sure to thank our staff members, being Yarla Goats and Red Falcon. Yarla Goats streams on Twitch quite regularly, and Red Falcon is responsible for the Red Falcon hel heli mods on the Daisy Workshop on PC. We are happy to have you folks here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.